And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Friday Fireside. Um, unfortunately, today I'm in the office and not actually next to the fire like I was um, a few weeks ago. If you were online and um, you watched us, um, uh, you, you watched us talking to uh, to Graham Raddings, and we were having a look at Folio a few a few weeks ago. Um, it's my absolute pleasure this afternoon to introduce everybody around the world to uh, Rich Wall. Um, I have the privilege of working in the team with Rich in the in the client services team in in EMEA, and Rich has kindly agreed to have a conversation with us this afternoon, um, with his perspective on Canvas, which is I'm really interested in because, like me, Rich was a a Canvas user um, before moving to to Instructure. So there's a a very interesting perspective that we're going to have on this and Rich's background is a little bit different in the sense of um, sort of the, the institutions that, that we, we normally talk about. So um, let me introduce Rich Wall. Rich, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm all right. Uh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. I'm not sat by a fireside either, but I have uh, the radiator on and my feet pressed up against it. So it's lovely and warm. And I also just as a, as a potential uh, warning, I do have my dog with me as well because working from home, so you might get to see her at some point. Uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely to be here. Yeah, I, I had a, you know, I had a, an unusual path into Canvas as a customer. I, um, so we were, we, whilst I know a lot of our customers at, at Canvas are, are working in higher education or, or in, in more formal settings, we, we, we were, um, what's, what you'll, Many people will be familiar with the concept of a, a social enterprise. So we were um, kind of working in the non-profit space, but um, using kind of enterprise and, and, and creating products and services and selling them, and the profits were being reinvested into good causes. So um, in our case, we were, we were running uh, training courses for uh, people who wanted to learn about best practice when it comes to not profit, not for profit and charity okay. as well. So either maybe people who are looking to give something back or people who are uh, volunteers or people who are charity sector aspiring uh, professionals or people who are already working in charities and not for profits who recognize that unlike a lot of other sectors where you know there are really uh, established norms for professional development, obviously the charity sector doesn't spend a lot on itself um, because it has other places where it tends to spend its money. So um, we were, uh, you know, in a startup environment, creating something that needed to be low cost, needed to be efficient with people's money and also with their time as well. So um, running courses online with Canvas was uh, a really good journey, and uh, and I'm delighted to be to be here now with Instructure as well. It's been uh, a few months, and it, it's, yeah. it's it's been great so far. Loving it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think, you know, a lot of the time we do when we host these sessions and, you know, when we, we run a lot of our sort of conversations at our conferences, you know, we do focus on um, university. Um, we focus on schools and, and colleges and, and we focus, you know, sometimes on around business schools and the use that they will they will have as well, where they're looking at, um, at sort of um you know, a business model and delivering courses to executives. Yeah. But it's really interesting to see this from another perspective of, of like that social enterprise side that you're talking about. And and what I want us to discuss sort of this afternoon will be some of the, you know, the similarities the, in the rollout that you did, you know, not so long ago in the past when you, we, you were rolling out Canvas to yes. how that carries over into your role and, you know, how that compares to when you're working with, um, you know the big institutions, the organisations that we're working with. Um, Completely, I, I, I thought I thought there were going to be big differences. You know, my role now is so I'm services consultant, and it's. I think uh, my experience with Canvas so far has been one of like breadth and being a kind of uh, uh, somebody who who covers a lot of bases. So I work as a services consultant, and if you've been through a Canvas implementation in Amir, you'll know that we've got implementation consultants who deliver on the sort of the technical side of things. And we've got learning consultants who deliver on the pedagogical side. And my role kind of covers both, plus a, a few aspects of, of project management internally. But um, that that kind of mirrors my experience as a customer where I was working in a startup environment that were very, relatively few of us, you know, where, whereas one organization, I might work with a higher institution, higher education institute now, 
and their project team for the people who are rolling out Canvas um, would be the size of like our entire organization previously. So I, I didn't expect to find as much common ground as I have, but there are some really universal themes that my experience as a Canvas customer, where I was somebody who was kind of responsible for the, the business case, um, the, the, the technical understanding, and also leading on the, the kind of pedagogical rollouts, yeah. um, where actually there are so many things in common with that experience that all Canvas institutions are going through. And so I, you know, I hope people watching this today will, will hear some of the experiences I had and go, yeah, we've, we've been through that as well. And, and maybe uh, they can pick up one or two tips because I'm constantly returning to my experience as a customer when I'm speaking to our, our customers now and onboarding them. Cool. What we'll do then, um, we'll go through some of the, the sort of the key questions that um, we'll think about when rolling out Canvas. We'll we'll talk sort of pedagogically as well, and 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 we'll have a look at some of the tools within within Canvas that you found particularly useful in the situation that you were in. And what we'll do is we'll look at those as well in terms of you know where they may be useful for sort of other customers in in whichever organisation they're in. Um, one thing we should do, and what we should say to everybody watching um you know this 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 afternoon is if you have any questions for myself or rich you know just just put them in the comments and we'll load them up in it and we'll try and answer those if we can um you know i'm obviously um as usual in the most boring town in the uk and we have to mention grantham on every live stream um if anybody can remember any of the interesting facts about grantham and famous people we'd love to hear your comments um in in the in the comments on this um whereabouts are you rich is it what, what what's the most interesting thing about where you are at the moment uh, i'm in balcombe in west sussex um which we moved to a few months ago the most interesting thing about us is that there is a viaduct down the road from us that um in our sleepy little village in the middle of west sussex has become an instagram influencer spot where um young uh mainly quite young uh, and and fashionable people from all over the world turn up here to take a picture underneath the viaduct that is local to us um so if you go on instagram and you type in balkan you'll see about a thousand two thousand of the same picture with different influences in them um and also that that viaduct contains 11 million bricks which i learned um which is exactly the same number as the viaduct in Stockport, if you are uh, a northerner, so uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I never knew that. Well, that was so, accurate. so accurate on the on the bricks. Um, but yeah, anybody watching, if you'd like to put in the comments where you're watching from as well, we always like to see um, you know where where around the world um, we're, we're reaching to. Um, okay, so let, let's go for some some questions then. Um, you're in this enterprise you've obviously got the challenges of being a small organization there and you you were in this situation where you bought canvas so i suppose you know explain that situation to us why did you buy canvas you know what was the situation before and what was the reasoning behind that well it started it started with the looking at the budgets for the year ahead mm. <laughs> which i think is where a lot of big decisions get made in businesses um uh, and, and i'm sure in in our in our education uh, customers, it's exactly the same. We were looking at the, the Drupal-based bespoke learning platform that we had, um, which was dependent upon the kind of uh, one developer who I never actually met face to face. He was he was only approachable via email. We were we were putting thousands into 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 something that was not reliable, that was not flexible, and that if something went wrong, there was one guy who could fix it in the entire world. Um, and that, like, it came from a place of understanding risk and kind of going, right, well, we need to, we're a small team, we need to be able to control what is the risk to our time, what's the risk to our balance sheet. Um, and so I said, right, I, I need something that's reliable. I need something that if it breaks, that there are thousands of people out there who will notice it before I do. Um, and that, you know, if there's downtime, that it, it'll be down for like seconds at most because we don't want customers coming to us kind of expecting us to fix things because first and foremost I, I was working as a generalist you know I have tech skills mm -hmm. but I shouldn't have been distracted in order to to kind of be handling support tickets that were beyond um, my, my job spec and, and having the support and the ticketing system that, that Canvas had was a big attraction and then where there were problems um, 
you know, every every organization that uses an LMS will at some point encounter a technical problem. And sometimes it's because of a, a specific use case. So it's not something to do with the LMS in general, but how you're using it. Um, and in those situations, I was like, I don't want to be on my own with this problem because there's anybody who's run a small business will know it feels quite isolating at some time when you have a problem and there's nobody else in the world who shares your problem. And then with Canvas, when I started to learn about the community, that is what one of the things that sold it to me from an operational perspective and a workflow perspective over some of the alternatives, because I was like, okay, there are tons of people out there, some of whom are uh, Canvas experts, like to, to a degree that I will never be. And, you know, and I won't forget that there's some incredible knowledge in, in the community um, and people who have done extraordinary things with Canvas. And as a user, I kept returning to that again and again and again, because um, we, we just couldn't rely on a system. We didn't want to have to rely on a system that would always be breaking and that, where the answers were never there. So um, having that dedicated support team at Canvas was was really helpful. Having a CSM, somebody I could go to and say, Chris, I'm having a problem with, with this. Can you help? Was was incredibly reassuring. And just, I mean, it, 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 it grew our capacity to go and focus on the things that we should have been focusing on, which were customers and our content and our marketing and all the things that we wanted to spend our time focusing on. So it was it was about that. And then, you know, we, we weren't unrealistic. We, we knew that we had quite an unusual use case for Canvas. We weren't, you know, the, the primary customers for whom Canvas had been designed. You know, we, we weren't a higher education institute, but we did have, um, you know, security knowing that with the LTIs that can plug into Canvas, the basically whatever direction we wanted to take the, the, the tool in, we yeah. could take it because it was an it was an early part of my my time working where I did and and being able to to make a decision that would be flexible and scalable in the future was important. Yeah. We, we we had ambitions to go beyond just um, selling short courses online, but actually to you know, uh, we got we got in the end approval for running apprenticeships and the kind of if we had gone for something a little bit more scaled back and a little bit more slimmed down and maybe something that, you know, lots of other startups yeah. might have gone for, then the reporting data uh, and, the, and the, the kind of mechanisms of, of, of how Canvas handles data provisioning would have been something that we would have needed when we got to the growth that we, we were looking for. So yeah. it was it was a tool for now and it was a tool for the future. I see. So, you know, you know, that security, that sort of safety blanket, I suppose, in terms of the backup that you have there. And I think, you know, one of the things you you're mentioning there where, where you talk about Chris, who is obviously one of the, he, one of the customer success managers we work very closely with now, um, you know, but some people watching, um, you know, may not understand the role of a customer success manager. It, it's one of those things that a lot of people that I know that when I work with, with, with with the customers from a, a consultancy perspective that partnership is, is is a huge thing that we that we have um so in terms of you know what you saw as a customer then hmm. and now being on the other side of the fence you know how, how's that affected your approach to the way that you work with with the customers that um, you know you're involved in their rollout, you know, in terms of the, sort of the partnership aspect. I mean, I I kind of realised, and I, and I, <laughs> when I became a colleague of Chris, I sort of realised that I was one of those customers that was a bit of a pest because I would ask questions constantly yeah. and be going, "Well, how can Canvas do this? How can Canvas achieve this?" And then I recognise as a consultant now that not every customer is built that way. That's not their personality. Or maybe they don't have the operational time and attention to be kind of um, wondering about every possibility because Canvas is really flexible. And and um, having being aware now as a service consultant that I have, um, for the customer's perspective, things that they don't know that they don't know. So being, you know, for me now, I'm thinking, right, if I was in their shoes and 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 I was working with the problems that they're talking about. Um, what can I preempt with this customer that I know is going to be an issue for them uh, in a few weeks, or I know that could be an advantage for them in future? You know, is there something that um, is there an LTI that another customer has worked with that I have now seen as as somebody who's on the inside, or yeah. if there's something that's beyond my um, beyond my comprehension, my knowledge, and my experience of Canvas, I'm, I'm now connected into a network of other people. 
And one thing I've noticed culturally and structurally that people are, are very generous with is, is their time and their experience. So, you know, as a, as a new member of staff at Instructure, it's been a really great learning experience to see what Canvas really can do, you know, um, and, yeah. um, you know, we all start off as, as beginners, but um, I think uh, people very often when they're transitioning into a new LMS are up against it in terms of time. They're going through um, a transition in terms of operations. They've maybe got some challenges in terms of getting staff to, to use a new tool uh, and everything that comes with that. And, and the big learning for me, as having been through it from a customer, is to really understand the context in which they might be asking a question. So, um, okay. yeah, you know, they, they might be asking a technical question, but the biggest problem on their plate might actually be more to do with the transition from one LMS yeah. to another. I mean, we, we, had, um, we had a relatively simple LMS prior to this, that we had customized and, and, and made bespoke and, and had done some particular things. And the migration from our Drupal platform into Canvas was was pretty simple in terms of, you know, if we wanted to get to what I think uh, my director at the time was saying was a minimum viable product, that kind of that advice to write, let's make this transition simple, quick, easy, and get some courses rolled out ready for customers. The, the kind of support that Canvas from a services point of view can deliver it is really good from that because the, the training is yeah. really good. The tool's really accessible. There are guides for literally everything. And that was, that was great. Um, and as a consultant, it's part of my job is to understand, right, does the customer just need that? Are they trying to get something rolled out quickly to kind of, um, you know, just to kind of uh, recreate what they have done in a previous LMS for a deadline? Or are they transitioning in a way where they're going, okay, what more can Canvas yeah. do? The, you know what what how can i make the most of my new purchase and i remember being in a situation where i was migrating content from one platform into canvas and then realizing oh hang on a minute well because i've got this feature with the discussions tool i could do more with this i could be a little bit more ambitious pedagogically and then all of a sudden as somebody as a as a manager in a service who is transitioning from one area to another i then the, the challenge for me from a change management perspective is to is to manage that workflow and kind of go okay how long is this going to take for me to kind of transition this and i have to say you know chris and and, and um the, the the team who i had supporting me were really good in terms of the, the advice for for managing that kind of uh stuff that, that, that goes beyond the guides and the push button aspect of the training yeah. the more kind of intangible stuff about helping helping our organization move from one place to another and judge yeah. how ambitious to be and how quick to be ambitious so, so let's let, let's think about that point that you're talking about there with, with sort of that that change in the implementation and the minimum sort of viable product you've spoken about you know moving from this bespoke system that you used to have and i think this is one of the things that um i think rings true to me across sort of many organizations of, of many many sizes so morag's decided she wants to be on the telly box she's Hello. having a okay She's going to lie down. So, so yeah, my questions um, around that is, is if we work with a very large university, for example, you know, there's obviously they're generally moving from a previous platform. Mm -hmm. There's content. And one of the concerns is, you know, that some some teachers will have is what's my content going to be like when when it comes over? Yeah. And I think there's a there's a challenge, isn't there, to this in the sense that the the reason to switch platforms is ultimately because we're looking for a better experience for the people that we're delivering courses courses to. We want them to have the best experience that possibly we have. Now, obviously, you, you know, when this is your business and it, it's a small business, how, how did you sort of approach that then with this idea that actually you've got one system with courses that can be delivered to thinking, okay, we've got to get that over with a minimum sort of viable product. You know, how, how do you sort of approach that? You know, do you have to have it ready from the off? What's what sort of the situation that you took, in, yeah, took there? I, I, I think, you know, you, the reality is we would all love a world where we transition from one area to another and it, it is instantly ready. But the, 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 the greater reality is that you can do that. You can have it in, in, in the same format. And, you know, that was the initial um, plan. But then you start seeing things like, you know, the ability to to uh, 
set conditional unlocking of certain areas and we're going well actually um we you suddenly apply the context of your business to the new tool so we'd had an issue where we were going okay learners are coming onto the course and we know anecdotally that engagement is a real issue for us and so okay. in order for us to make sure that as many people get to the end of the course as possible we have to kind of manage their journey through the course and our previous lms didn't allow us to do that it didn't allow us okay. to keep things unlocked for a certain time or locked it didn't always things like you know um prerequisites and requirements as people move through um uh, a course it didn't allow us to to kind of uh give give as many visual indicators as to people's success and so as we kind of you know we're moving into this we're suddenly realizing well actually there's there's more we can do to manage people's experience and you know learning and adding these things didn't actually didn't actually take that long um but but when you're working with 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 fine timelines it's actually about going okay we need to kind of realize that whilst initially i think at the top of the hour a lot of my thinking early on as a as a as a customer as i said was about risk management and about going we need something that, that, that we know how much it's going to cost and we know something that's not going to take up too much of our time as soon as you start to realize actually well i bought something here that that um can make us way more effective pedagogically all of a sudden you, you you've kind of got to shift your thinking and, and reallocate some some resources to this and try to okay. plan out the, the structure and be more ambitious so i mean i'll give you some examples of, of what we did we we had um we had a a a cohort on every course that was geographically very spread um and so you'd have people from um yeah thank you uh, we'd have people from all over the country and one of the things that we decided that we thought was important to do because it was blended learning was was to almost kind of um uh, hack the course in a way where people would feel almost obliged to be interactive with each other you know the yeah. course there were things in the success of the course and the engagement of the course that depended on people introducing themselves and talking about not just why they were doing the course, but what they expected from other people on the course um, and to share and learn from each other's experiences. That kind of pro-social learning was was really important. But we'd yeah. found with our previous LMS that because we didn't have the tools to encourage that, it felt a little bit like um, the way I would describe it is, is like when you were a kid and you went to a school disco and for the first like hour at least everyone would sort of stand around the yeah. edge nervously not join in with the dancing and we wanted to kind of find ways to to, to break that ice so we had for instance uh, i mean this is a, a dummy course that, that i use with, with customers now in my philosophy course but what we would do is for instance we would have a discussion around why you would sign up which you know uh, you could have there and it would be in an intro module and we wouldn't yeah. allow people to access further parts of the course until they had contributed to that initial intro discussion so we would sort of set the prerequisite for, for you know module two um and we'd come into here and, and sort of make sure that the prerequisite was to to make sure you've selected the intro module and what we meant by that in in our use case for the induction module was okay at the very least you have to come into this discussion and you yeah. have to contribute and, and and we made it a graded discussion to kind of um uh, make it kind of higher up people's agenda and, and really make it feel like something people uh, would take seriously. And we made it a kind of a graded video discussion. So your your job was okay. to submit an intro video, um, which for some people, when they're doing a, an online course in front of people they've never met, feels like a kind of uh, a risky thing to do it socially. But um, we wanted to sort of put it out there from from day one. Actually, no, you, you know, you need to. <laughs> you need to be getting sorry my dog wants to get out of the room you need to be okay. interacting with other people in order to make this course a success so um yeah. and, you know and for people who who were really kind of uh shy about uh submitting the video or who didn't feel like technically that they wanted to to submit straight away or, or, or for whatever reason you know we we did say to people well look all we're asking you to, to do here is contribute to this discussion and from canvas's perspective it wants you to do two things it either wants you to, to complete the task that we've asked you to do and submit a video, or yeah. you could just be commenting on somebody else's discussion post. And that's what we really wanted people to do, is to interact with other people. And that meant that when we came to parts of the course that were face-to-face, -face, people had already been kind of forced into being sociable with each other. And that meant yeah. that when they were starting to do collaborative work or when they were coming, you know, later on in the course, we started to use the, the conferences um, to host, you know, webinars with with people from across our sector, that meant actually the conversation flowed more freely. So for for us, it was important that 
when we had a strategy pedagogically that we could use canvas in a way that would reinforce that and start building yeah. it really and and that I, I mean th that sort of thing snowballs because once um once people get the idea that oh my job here to be successful is to interact with each other um then then by the end of the course it's 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 actually kind of um just just becomes normalized so yeah, that, yeah. that was really great for us I, I really like that i think you know you know within our team with the learning consultancy we obviously offer um you know webinars and training which you know well, you know this you're involved in it <laughs> maybe the people online what we're talking about is you know there is that sort of button training isn't there that we, that we deliver but then you've got the pedagogical side of it and that creating that connection whilst online i think it is is a really big thing and uh, um what you're talking about there of creating that safe space at the beginning to start to understand sort of the social interactions with other people the expectations there and, and how it works with that being early on, I really like that. And what you've described there that I really like as well is the the idea of you've joined the course. The first discussion is it, the the first graded thing is um, is a discussion, and, and and I like that because I you know it's you know I, I study online with with some of the institutions um, that we work with, and you know there is initially that engagement that first part is really really important and you know you do want to do really well in your assignments early on um well you probably want to do well all the way through but that first one is right okay i need to engage with this and i think like you're saying you're creating those connections there early on within that so i think that's a great idea and i, and I think it, it relates to the context i mean one of the reasons why it was particularly important for us is because all of our data from previous courses had showed that the more people engage with each other the more they engage with the course and the more they engage with the course the more sustainable our business is so yeah. you know there were, there were sound financial reasons and the other thing was you know we were in a position where we were removing um live events from our calendar um because th they weren't as cost effective um yeah. but actually we could we could have a higher profit margin on the course if we could keep more of that social interaction online you risk cutting off your nose to spite your face if you don't do that properly because then people disengage because yeah. you know one of the things we were selling the course on is the idea that hey some of you want to build careers because of this course and you don't have a network but come and find a network from us and engage with other people and you know, that, that made a massive difference for us so it seems like a small thing but now when i do training with our customers I remember early on when I was working for Canvas, someone said, well, is this just push button training? Can I just get a recording and, and have you send it to me? And I, I said, well, you have the option of watching the recording afterwards. You know, we can d do it live and then you can send the, the, rec the recording around. But actually, the value in our training isn't me showing you where the button is for um, for, for uh, requirements, which, by the way, I didn't show you before, so it's um, it's here. <laughs> but. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's not in the value in that it's in the context of me understanding your business well enough to go and hey you mentioned this ambition pedagogically well how about you try this or you know have you considered using this tool and and um and that, that's the real value in, in in what we do and it's something that yeah. i probably I, you know I, I i didn't recognize until until a little later in my canvas journey there were there were things i mean around the kind of the setting requirements in a module um, at first, I was only doing it for things where I really wanted a, a student to do things. And I was kind of forgetting that little things like a requirement for viewing a pre-course reading list here. I mean, it, it helps to instruct the learner, but also one of our learners came back to us and said, you know, I'm using the, the mobile uh, app for Canvas when I'm going through yeah. your course. And some things you've set as, as view as a requirement and some things you haven't. Could you set it for, for all of them, set a requirement for everything? Because then I get this little green tick button when I've completed something as I'm going through the mobile course and that helps me keep track yeah. of, of where I am as a learner and and that was a kind of that was a light bulb moment where I was like oh, okay right yeah I've realized the, 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 the value of that so um that was great I mean you know so much of of what we did was about listening to to feedback from our customers and then going right well, well what tool can can canvas yeah that will allow us to do that so for instance we we would look at kind of the analytics of somebody because we we wanted everybody to on our courses to be successful and get to the end um but what we what we weren't sure was was okay well what is it about the successful learners that's different from yeah. the ones who aren't successful and then you know we've we've got tools in canvas like like new analytics which 
you know, a allow us to do that, to look through a course, both on an individual um, and on a course level and sort of say, OK, well, the, the people who are getting to the end, let's, let's pinpoint them. Let's look at what they're right. actually doing. Um, and, you know, let's let's actually kind of get a, a, an idea of, of their journey through Canvas and see what the difference is. And, and actually, yeah. you know, in our case, um, one of the things that, that made a big difference was are they interacting with other people? Um, okay. In fact, we, we, we used, we used um, I mean, uh, this is this is an aside, we, we used, in terms of the, the course roles, um, we had people working with us who were volunteers, who were kind of professional mentors. So we actually used the observer role that you can have in, in a Canvas course. So if I, if I come to my people here, these are all dummy profiles, by the way. Um, anybody who's... Um, uh, Who's who's watching along at home and is a football fan might recognise some of the names, but we had the the observer role that you can see here um, mm. was one that we gave to volunteer mentors who who worked on the program, and we sort of said right if you're a volunteer mentor you're going to have three or four people on each program and you're going to be responsible for sort of supporting them through the course, and it was a great way for us as a as a non profit to utilise our volunteers because we could you know target the support that they were giving to individuals. And whilst previously on our old LMS, we'd had a mentoring program, the, the, one of the biggest pieces of kind of workflow and labor from us uh, was actually volunteer support, making sure that the volunteers who are mentoring individuals on the course had all the information that they need. And that would mean a lot of Slack messages. It would mean a lot of emails. It would mean a lot of phone calls catching up with them. It would mean spreadsheets that we had created to kind of update on how people were progressing. Canvas did all of that for us because yeah. they could do it on their phone as well, which was which was massive. We gave them the, the Canvas parent app and they were away. Yeah. Um, so I like it, that. Yeah, it's when you when you think of the observe, you know, the parent app. You know, we often sort of think of that tool only being sort of for that purpose of a parent watching something else. But with it being the observer situation, they can look at that. So, so what sort of interactions did, would the observer? do you, you know you say there to support the, the students through through canvas so what sort of interactions would they be involved with um you know yeah, in I, there oh. so, so for instance some of the stuff that we would teach about was um like successful fundraising skills so you know some of your learners uh, some of your viewers today might, might not realize that you know fundraising in itself is is a profession it's a recognized profession and uh, there are some people out there who are professionally exceptional at it and then um, whenever people kind of experience a really good fundraising event, if they run a marathon and they have a really good time working with the charity and raise loads of money, there's usually a reason for that. Um, yeah. And equally, when people have bad experiences with fundraising, you know, it's very often because people have been given poor quality training or, or are not working according to professional standards. So, you know, having the ability of somebody who is a professional fundraiser to act as a mentor on our course and be able to, for instance, look in the speed grader and see the feedback that somebody has got on some work and to be able to kind of message people directly, um, but to be able to do it within the context of Canvas and kind of be able to, these guys are all professional volunteers, but they would be able to kind of have a, a church and state separation between their working life and their volunteering life, which was great for them. And I mean, everyone on the course we work with tended to be juggling lots of things, including our volunteers. So we would have, you know, learners who were also, you know, full time in full time education or full time work or or busy parents. And that would be the same for our volunteers. And so some of the communication tools that we our customers might be familiar with in terms of being able to, to triangulate between a student, a parent and a university or, or a school, um, we were able to do that between volunteer um, uh, at kind of aspirational charity sector fundraiser uh, and us, or in, in, in sometimes where people have been sort of uh, supported by an employer to come on our course, we were able to use that as well. So it made, a, it made a massive difference in terms of being able to help people build relationships with each other at a distance, yeah. uh, which obviously parents and, and, and and their students don't don't have to do, but in our case was was really important. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the points you're raising there, how you've spoken of sort of face to face side of things, but working with people from, you know, different areas, you know, all over the world and that, you know, it means you do have to create that fine, you know, the correct balance of face to face, um and allow that communication to take place sort of asynchronously uh, and, and be simple for people to do it and, and access it 
I, I suppose on on that point of view, then you know, you're you're putting students into say students, you, you know, the customers in this sense when we're, we're talking about it this way, um, in, into these courses. It was a change from a previous system that you you bought into it. How did you sort of assess their um, I'm trying to think you know you know the feedback behind this their satisfaction with what you were doing you know how, how were you able to make improvements and things along those lines and, and what sort of things did they tell you that made you think actually maybe we approach that the wrong way and actually there's the, there's a better solution that we can use that's a good question i mean the, the one of the things that we, we kept going to again and again was the sort of account level analytics so like um Obviously, there's the, the new analytics at course level, and that was used very much to kind of work out, okay, on an individual basis or in terms of this specific course or this specific module, what's helping people to be successful. The, the kind of more account level reporting and the analytics was, you know, this is a, our one from our internal uh, <laughs> training one that we use. And you can yeah. see that uh, we've got a lot of activity here, which is, it coincides with, with Canvas Con. So um, okay. <laughs> you can tell it's yeah. ours. We were using this dashboard view to kind of say, right, well, what is it about our work here that is being successful in, in this course? And then we would roll out another course and make some changes and be able to compare and contrast. So that that was that was really helpful. Uh, it was a lot more to do, though, with, with kind of the feedback of what, what people were telling us. So one of our biggest concerns as a, as a private business, you know, when you, if you go to a, you know, go do a degree at Oxford University to, to kind of, as an example, then yeah. you're going in already trusting completely 100% the quality of the course that you're being given because it's, you know, it's it's a, and, and, and a lot of our higher education uh, institutions, yeah. it's their reputation that allows people to, to at least have some, um, it, it buys them some time from an engagement perspective and makes people yeah. kind of value what they do. For most people really had to get a sense right away that, that what we were doing was good because there's a lot of professional development courses out there there's a lot of um, competition for their time and attention and actually one of the the biggest kind of concerns that we had from some people was like the nervousness that they would be overwhelmed so if okay. you if you're working full-time and you're studying and you've got three kids and <laughs> you, you've got life going on um, then then when you look at your list of modules in front of you when you first open up a canvas course is it going to be something that makes you go like this, this, i feel really excited and some people would want loads of material and they would want yeah. to get, you know as much bang for their book as possible and then an equal number of our customers um would want to kind of feel reassured that they could do this and that, that they're not going to be overwhelmed so we we kind of had to manage that with with some of the, the responding to some of the feedback that we got from from customers about that you know, it was actually something I, I, I talked about with with the Canvas team at the time and, and our trainers. Um, uh, and, and Nicholas was was quite useful with, with this at, at the time. Yeah. And talking about how, okay, the way that you label the content in your course will make a difference here. So if I give you an example in, in, in this philosophy course, um, if I come here and there are, you know, 10 modules and they're, they're all as busy as the intro module, then those students who are going to feel overwhelmed yeah you know they're, they're going to look at this and go well, i'm never going to do this and and, and give up. And that would be kind of critical for, for for certain aspects of our business so one of the things yeah. that canvas allows you to do is within the rich content editor it gives you um a, a word count um, and from that we were able to work out estimated reading time so for instance the the first thing that we would do is go okay well let's change this and say right um five min read um and we did that for everything as a naming convention in our course based on the feedback that we got from people. And all of a sudden people were going, this is great because now I can go through my course and I can calculate, right, I've got a spare hour tonight, I can do this much work. Yeah. I've got, and you know, and when we got it wrong and when we miscalculated, people told us. So we knew they were paying attention yeah. to that, which was, which was great. The other bit was, you know, I know Canvas has got these lovely little badges here for like, you know, this is an assignment, this is a quiz, this is a discussion. New Canvas users don't always pick up on that. And one of the things that we were advised by, by I say, your team, I'm in it now, um, yeah. was to just really, like, you know, really obvious about it. So, you know, intro discussion. I've, I've put it here in my, my example course is, you know, intro discussion. But I might, for instance, on, on you know, the course I was running then go, 
right, this is a quiz, so I'm going to say quiz, incoming knowledge check, okay. and just make sure that that kind of naming convention is there for everything, so that everyone at all time was really clear on what they needed to do. Yeah. The people who were on the other side of that, that coin who were like, okay, I want as much content as possible, um, what we were able to do then is to say, okay, here is some stuff that is that is core content, and here is some stuff that deep, that's, that's more deep dive. Yeah. And really put that up so people would feel like, okay, there's there's something here that I can do. And one of the things that, that I wish we'd spent more time on, actually, we, we started to do it but never never fully followed up on, was to use mastery pathways um, in order to kind of get the sense that, hey, there's some unlockable content here. Yeah. I know, you know, the, the, the initial idea around mastery pathways and if, if you're watching and you don't know it's the idea that you know you can differentiate a user's journey through a course based on the kind of the scores that they are getting i'm going to let my dog yeah. out um, go on, go away. more like the star of the show <laughs> but you can differentiate your way through a course um and you know the, the people who are getting higher scores can get different things than the people who are maybe need a little yeah. bit more support. For us, it was a slightly different use case. I was I was kind of agnostic about people's grades. Um, I, I really wanted them to to get the, the best experience of the course and learn as much as possible. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I like but yeah, but by kind yeah. of we were able to use mastery pathways to say right, um, you can. Uh, you can unlock more if you are keen and interested, if this is something that yeah. interests you. So we used it for that purpose, which, which again, was something I, like, I picked up in the community. Yeah, I like that that choice side of it. And I know, you know, with, with the work that we do as, as the team, um, you know, not so much as at the moment where, you know, we're, we're online. So, you know, sometimes the, um, the Zoom meetings sort of narrow down the people that, that you get to go and talk to, but, um, you know, within the team, I work with a lot of the sort of institutions across the across the Netherlands, and, and would visit quite regularly. And um, you know, in circumstances, you had the opportunity to discuss with students how they were using Canvas, and that idea of the the core and the enrichment content. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've seen that go down very, very well with students. Uh, and one of the scenarios there was, um, I've got my my job as a student that, that I'm working in as well, you know, that they, they, they've got those sort of challenges um, and then they had the, the, the studying to do. And what was hap what they would do and what they liked was they could go through the core material, make sure that they were getting the assignments completed and, you know, before the deadline. But because the courses were still open for them afterwards where they had the access or because the courses were open for them into the following year, you know, mm -hmm. although it was closed and they couldn't, contribute they could go back and 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 view that enrichment material which would sort of you know it, it was sort of scaffolding for the work that they were doing that they were building on the next year uh, and so i i really like that process of separating things out uh, and yeah. it means that the journey is not so linear all the time as well and the students get the ability to to you know to, to go between the areas of interest so I mean, that, that's exactly it. We were dealing with a really broad topic because, you know, there's, there's not enough good training around for people working in nonprofits, but it's as, it's as broad a sector as any. And yeah. and to, to say that you can sum it all up in one course is, is a really ambitious thing to do. And it's a movable feast. The, 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 the topics we were working yeah. on are, are totally different today to where they were two years ago. So, you know, things like um, the something simple, like the lock until feature. So if I'm, if I'm, Okay. creating something new in, in here it's the example of ethics but if it's some new fundraising regulation that's coming out i know that i'm going to be de delivering something on this by january because i'm working on it the customer doesn't need to know that it's that it's not completely ready yet or that i'm still working with a, a, okay. a partner on completing content but i can create something i can publish it but then i can say it's locked until a certain date you know in this yeah. case i can i can do that and we would do that quite regularly where we were going okay this is part of our content plan, and there's no point from a kind of uh, an adding value to our customers and, and getting them to anticipate value. There's no point in us developing these things in secret, but we don't want to put it on total show yet. So we were kind of yeah. using it to, to almost market further things that we could do to keep our customers engaged and keep them coming back to us. And and, and so from that perspective, yeah. I, I, it's probably a different use case from some of some HE institutions, but I know some of the ones that I've spoken to are like, okay, great. How can we 
how can we use Canvas to get people interested in courses they might not already be taking? And yeah, yeah. I think we, what, we used um, we use public courses for that all mm -hmm. the time. We give people a little drip feed of what they could have later. Okay, I'm just thinking what you back to what you've said there though about the lock and till and the the sort of use cases around that with it, with that side of it. I, I think that ability to release content um, as needed is is great. And I think in terms of a change that we're talking about in terms of the workload for somebody to understand that I, I don't have to create everything and have everything ready at, at once. But I agree completely with you on sort of the confidence within within that content on what's coming. You know, when I was teaching, I was working with um, uh, secondary schools, um, 11 to 19 year olds. And, you know, when we were using Canvas with sort of A level students in the sciences, exactly the same thing as well about um you know the worry of being overloaded with the work when it comes through within the modules and the students absolutely loved like you say the mark has done um the view that it gives them the ticks um and let, let's be honest and if there's some teachers watching this then then it's not just the students who are worried about being overloaded with work here and and yeah. the ability to kind of have things you know, no, no teacher has got 100% of their lessons planned for an entire no. year. If they are, I haven't met them yet. And, no, and I, they should always be improving it. And so the ability to have things that are there, you know it's coming down the track, but it's not quite cooked yet. And, yeah. and, that, that and, uh, and there's the other stakeholders there within that. And, you know, the point was that a, um, you know, a parent spoke to me about this and saying, what I actually really like is I know we can't see the work yet, but I know that this journey is planned and I've got a rough sort of guide yeah. of how you are going to get my child. I know they're young adults, but it doesn't matter as a parent, does it? They're still your child forever. How you're going to get my child to to the point, um, you know, the best point that they can be in. And, you know, I think that's really important. And I, and I think, again, as well, you know, when we look at online courses, we talk a lot about things like progress bars and and that side of things. And I always wonder what, you know, is, is there a real benefit in a progress bar? I've completed 75% of the content. Whereas what I like personally with, with Canvas and the modules that you're describing, I think, and, and when we study online is um, that re-entry point. I've been sat on the train. I've done some work. I get home and then I go on my computer. Where was I? And we, I, that that's really, really useful, isn't mobile it? Mobile was massive for us. And the year before we got Canvas, I had three different students from our courses um, who had emailed in to say, I need to take a couple of weeks off because my laptop is either stolen or has been broken and it's not working anymore because our previous LMS didn't support mobile. And then you know, we we, <laughs> we would have to kind of make accommodations for that and we didn't have to anymore with, with Canvas because people were, you know, I, we had quite a young age group of, of learners. There were a lot of ex young professionals who, who wanted to be on the course. Um, and and they were not people who would be able to squeeze this in by by getting a laptop down and finding an hour here and there. Particularly the ones who had kids, and they were the yeah. ones who were being able to do it on their mobile, on the go. And that that was one of the things that we were able to sell our courses based on. So that was huge. On okay. I mean on the theme of of saving time, and I guess this would probably be like, yeah, I think there was, a, there was a nod to it in one of your earlier questions. And it's kind of a regret from something that we didn't make the most of. I think since I've, I've worked for Canvas, I've become more aware of the power of the API um, okay. from a technical perspective. So uh, as a customer, you know, I, I, was, I was probably one of the more technical members of, of my team. Um, and, and if I had been given the sort of time and attention to it, the API documentation could have been really useful to me. Okay. But I think one of the realities, and it's something that I, I'm mindful of when I'm doing implementations with customers now, is that you might have a really technically capable um, team in front of you who are who are doing an implementation of Canvas, but yeah. they might not have the bandwidth with all the other things that they are that are doing with managing that transition to sit down, look at the API um, documentation that we've got, which you know I, I've got open here, and it's um, okay. And one of our members, Simon Lee, uh, is is somebody who who enjoys writing documentation, and he's right. he. He's telling me how it's the best documentation he's ever seen. But, okay. You know, let me it, let me ask you a question then. Um, from what some of the probably some of the people watching are, are sort of thinking at the moment. Okay, so um, you and I, we 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 know what APIs are. Mm -hmm. um, 
some of the people watching won't know what an API is, but I don't want to ask the question on what is an API. What I want, what I would want to ask is when you're showing this technical documentation, which may scare some people, um, as yeah. soon as you get some code within there. What what what, what does it mean? What's what, what what's it why about? What's the potential the of it? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're asking why is the API? Why API? I, I guess. Yeah, well, why do I try and work out what this is? Yeah, well, yeah, what, no, yeah. what does it mean? Yeah, I guess. I guess for me, one of the things that I was doing, and in a business context, you're, you're often very head down. Mm. Someone gives you a process, and you go, "Right, I've, I've got to do this process, and then get on to the next job." And then sometimes you find yourself doing the same process again and again and again and again, and you, effectively things like you know, data entry or, or point and click. If you're finding you're doing something five or ten times in a row, and you think, "God, I wish this could be automated." Um, then it okay. then you know, the way that canvas has been built it can do that it can it can save you time what that requires is for you if you're the technical person or you have technical understanding to step back have a look at this documentation that we've got on screen um if you are looking at it it's quite because there are so many things that can be automated within canvas effectively anything that well nearly anything that you can do through the user interface in canvas so when you're using you know this view of canvas and you're in your account settings and your admin settings nearly anything that you can do in there plus a lot more can be done without accessing that front end of canvas using the api if you have somebody in your team who knows how to make an api okay. and, and 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 you know you could potentially automate that if they know a little bit of code a little bit of scripting now that, okay. that is something that, that for new canvas users can feel quite daunting i wish that we had got there sooner because you know, at a point where particularly now the world has changed and people are in the office less and they have less, sometimes a little bit less time to focus on things or they can get very easily sucked into processes where there's no one around them to say, why are you taking so long on this? Why is this, you know, why is this so inefficient? Yeah. Um, I, I really wish we'd done that because actually at a point where we had a few changes with the business and we needed to, for instance, make sure that um, our enrollments were as quick as possible. We had okay. a use case where people would would buy a course on our website, and then they would have to wait until me or my colleague or maybe the person covering us for when we're on holiday went online, checked their emails, would notice somebody's bought the course, go onto Canvas, enroll them in the right course, um, and add them okay. as a youth. We didn't we didn't realize, uh, you know. We, and again, this comes back to the the things that, as a customer, you don't know that you don't know. That as a consultant, I am always telling people is like, hey, you can cut down this process. You, you know, we. I had somebody in the team who was technical enough to set this up. I just never shown him this documentation. I'd never gone, Mike. Can you take yeah. a look at this? Can you set this up? And and so I didn't need to 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 go through this this very kind of intimidating documentation if you're a newbie and and read it all. All I needed to do really was to go, okay, I want to do something to do with enrollments, and just kind of basically control F and find the word enrollments <laughs> and find the way to talk about enrollments. And send it to the, my technical guy and go, can you make this less of a pain in the bum for me to, to be doing every day? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, I discovered that far too late. <laughs> I, I think the example you've given there is 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 one of the, you know, it is one of the big ones with, with things, isn't it? Uh, you know, enrollments of students as they're coming in. And and and, and you are in a business in a, that scenario of actually you know why why if i if i go onto your internet site and i sign up for your course and i've paid mm -hmm. why do i need to wait yeah, for, yeah, yeah. For, for this situation and you know what we're saying here is obviously there's the opportunity there to to sort of automate things along those that it doesn't all have to be done through the user interface you know some people push spreadsheets and don't they but that still takes time as well and you know there's just the freedom to do this in the way that works for your business, isn't it? That's the completely, yeah. and, and, it, and it comes it comes back to to the kind of advice I had for customers earlier, which uh, as a former customer and now somebody who's worked the other side, and like maybe our CSM don't like me for saying this, but like a good a good piece of advice is to take take whatever challenge you have in front of you with Canvas, and when you speak to your CSM, tell them tell them, oh, this is a pain in the bum. I'm taking so long over this. This is you know, or I, I wish I had more time to do this, but I can't do this. And you know, and tell them because you know, the more the more problems you you kind of you throw at your CSM, yeah. the more solutions you get back. And then you're like, okay, well now I have more time. I can 
you know, start start getting a little bit more adventurous yeah. with my instructional design or, or or whatever. So, you know, be yeah. a don't don't be afraid to be a, a slightly challenging customer as long as you're nice. Then you know, well, we've yeah. got a really good team, and and, and uh, I will say, Chris and, and Marco as as my CSMs were were really <laughs> really patient with me constantly, not whinging, but like kind of coming up with yeah. little problems them to solve with me so i loved it no the two fantastic members of the, well, the whole team is um you know fantastic the, the time and effort they put into the customers is is great and i think it's why you know we enjoy you know both of us you know as we're saying we've got smiles on our faces on a friday afternoon and it's not just because of the weekend it's because of the sort of the privilege of the job i think in terms of you know the customers that we get to work with and you know and i think in you know i have the privilege of 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 working with you i think it was just one one session of, of training when, when you were rolling out canvas but knowing that you're working with a group of people that are you know going to offer education that's going to going to have an impact on, on other people is is a is a really big thing um i'm conscious of the time rich and i'm conscious my monitor's about to go into power save so we'll stop that um it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you this afternoon and, and thank you for your for your stories um, I apologise to the people watching who were expecting some um, some sessions from Amir over, over the past few weeks. Um, we, we had to, uh, a bit of a situation where we 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 had to miss one of the sessions. Um, we are going to be offering another session. Uh, we should put this in in your diary now. Um, 18th of December. Um, we'll get this up on social media soon. Um, we'll be meeting with Jonas Pitalion, who is a customer success manager. So he works in the team that works very closely with the team Rich and I are in. And we are going to be uh, delivering a Christmas special. Um, it's, it's the day of our Christmas party. So we're going to be doing um, the 12 days of Canvas, um, going through our favorite things over the year, the new releases. Um, and uh, we'll do a bit of a review of 2020. Christmas jumper, John. Are you going to be? I, I will wear. I'll. I don't like Christmas jumpers, but I imagine I can wear one that day. I might <laughs> even go close to the fire and have the Christmas tree in the background. Um, but Jonas and I, um, yeah, we're going to go through some of the some of the new things that are in Canvas. Um, we'll be showing you our favourite tools. Um, we'll be going through. Um, we might even sing. Um, I, I don't know. We, we we might sing. But if you'd like to join us, um, yeah, that's going to be on the um, 18th of December. Um, and um, if there is anything else, you know, that you'd like us to talk about in 2021, uh, we'll be delivering these sessions more regularly, bringing other members of the team in um, to talk to talk on these sessions. If there's any particular topics that you would like uh, like us to cover. You know, put those in the comments. Um, uh, if there's things that you want to see within Canvas that that you 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 are interested in or pedagogical approaches, um, let us know. We'll be doing these sessions. We'll talk through them. We love talking about this stuff. Um, but put that in the comments, and, and we'll follow up on those. Um, and if you're a customer of Canvas, you're already using it, and you've got a great idea. You're doing inspirational things. You've got some great projects going on. Um, reach out to your customer success manager. They'll con they'll connect you with me. And what we can do is we can have a look at, at getting you on one of these sessions. You know, over the year we've had the uh, the likes of um, Cal, um, Paul. Um, you know, been on the sessions. We we had um, the team from University College Cork joining us. You know, they they've come on the sessions and the sessions and shown us the really really good things they're they're doing and the fantastic experiences they're providing for their students. Um, so it will be the usual we have to do sort of well rich we haven't mentioned the fact that he used to be a stand-up comedian as well so we need to go sort of two it was two was it two ronnies goodbye from me him <laughs> that one i can't, I can't remember no one, would, no one would have guessed that i i used to be professionally funny from what this so <laughs> um, yeah, goodbye okay. from him and it's goodbye from me was that uh, yeah i think that's the one yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll go with that have a great day, everybody. Have a great weekend and, and stay safe. Okay, bye-bye.